passage this morning is going to come from Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1, 11, and also chapter 2, 1 through 8. We've been continuing in this book. This is our third sermon in this series. Nehemiah chapter 1, 11, and also 2, 1 through 8. And today's message title is called An Opportunity. I'll read the word. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. And give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but the sadness of the heart. But then I was very much afraid, and I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruin and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And he said to the king, If it pleases the king, let the letters be given to me, given uh, given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gate for, for the gates, and for, of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for my house, for the house I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the hand of my God was upon me. Word of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you so much just for this opportunity just to come before you, to read your word, O Lord. I pray that you may open up your, our ears and our hearts to receive it. And Lord, may it mold and shape us to the people that you want us to be. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts may be holy and pleasing to you. Lord, I pray that your gospel may be preached and may your spirit work in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, we're in a sermon series called Under Construction. Um, lessons from the book of Nehemiah, where the basic plot of the story um, is about a rebuilding process of the city of Jerusalem after they were completely um, destroyed by the Babylonians when they took over most of the part that uh, took over most most of the world at that time. And now in our story, our city is being re- re- allowed to be rebuilt under the Persians. Of course, it's not without its challenges, and God uses a man named Nehemiah to come back to his hometown to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. I mean, Nehemiah was a child or a grandchild of exiles. His family was taken out of his homeland and placed into a foreign land for for his family to either serve or do other things there. And when they took over, now he's going back, going back to rebuild the walls. And this is kind of the focus of our entire series. It's it's about a process of revisiting places that we need to be and, and rebuilding. It's a process of being under construction in the hands of God We also learned that the church has always been under construction, and we as members of it are also always under construction. God is always working on us, always giving us new hope. At times, he gives us a new vision and a new calling in life while molding and shaping us for that task. This means, this is what it means to be a child of God. You know, a lot of times we think of being a child of God as just saying, I'm saved by grace through faith, and we're we're made God's children, and that's it, but there's more. God begins his work in us and through us, and we're being made into his image as we live out his calling and mission in our lives. My prayer for all of you is that God may not only op- God may open, up, may open up your eyes to the process that he is doing in your life so that you may not be discouraged when you face different obstacles or challenges, nor be filled with pride um, thinking that you're complete because we're always in the process of growing. And it's the same for the church as well. May we also see the process that God is doing in our community. You know, today we find ourselves right before Nehemiah begins this big project to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You know, up to this point, we learned that once Nehemiah heard, that the, heard of the broken state of, of Jerusalem, heard that the walls were still destroyed, 
heard that nobody was doing anything about it, no one could do anything about it, and their motivation was down, they had no morale, no nothing, he cried for days, days, and then went into a, went into a time of prayer for about three to four months. And now here in our text, during this time of prayer, we see an opportunity, an opportunity for open up for him to do something about it. You know, oftentimes in our moments of prayer, God moves us and helps us see different opportunities to do something. You know, as I was reflecting on this prayer, I was, hearing, I was listening to a, a, a podcast of a guy. Um, he's a guy that, that l- l- kind of started an organization about optimizing one's mind. And, and, and you know, he said he, was, he suffered at brain injuries as a child and was diagnosed of having a lot of learning disabilities. And he developed ways to fight through them and even overcome them. And I was listening to this guy. I don't, you know, it, it, he's an interesting guy. I didn't really agree with everything he said, but he shared his experiences and he said some insightful thoughts. He says most of the people, the most, most, most important two hours of the day is right when you wake up, the hour after you wake up, and also the hour before you sleep. And he says, because this is the only time we can actually control our time, because mostly throughout the day we're working, people tell us what to do, and, and you know, we're watching kids or doing something. And so it's usually these two hours of the day that we can take away all distraction and actually have a moment to, to control it, to meditate and plan. And, you know, he's talking about it, and, and he says, think about what you wake up to every morning. I want to ask you guys, when you guys wake up in the morning, what do you guys usually wake up to? Usually when I wake up, I, I pick up my phone and I look at it, and I look at my emails, and I skim through it, then maybe I look at the, the weather for a little bit, and then I hit the news button, and I just kind of read the news and say, oh, man, our, our, our nation sucks right now, and then keeps going. And, we, you know, usually you kind of do this, and you, and, you, and you just keep reading, and you occupy your mind, then you, then you go to Facebook and Instagram, and you're looking at it again, like just sitting, laying in your bed, and you do that. And he was like, what we actually do is we program our minds to, to think a certain way, responding rather than actually inputting something. And, and I, was, I was thinking about this. I mean, a lot of us, we have a lot of young children. They wake you up, and they pretty much, much dictate our lives. And there's never a moment to stop and let our minds rest and meditate and even pray. We're never able to tap into the God-given passions of our hearts to actually think about what to do with it, the burdens of our heart to ponder what we can do with it. And when reading this, I realized why Jesus Christ consistently always moved away from crowds to find time away to pray to God. Sometimes we hear of him waking up early in the morning to find alone time with him. And through these moments of prayer, we see that Jesus is able to focus back on the mission of God. And he's confident as he steps up. You know, as we get older, time moves so fast, doesn't it? I mean, 2018 came so quick. Um, you know, like usually when we look at our kids, they're always complaining that time's not moving. And they're like, are we there yet? And they're cl- cl- complaining about things. But for us, like you blink and it's like it's, it's 2018. We're going to blink again. It's going to be 2019. Weeks like go by like days now. And I wonder throughout our lives, do we never take that moment to actually sit down and pray and be like, God, what is it that you want for my life? Or do, do we just blink and time just goes by and then we're going to be dead one day? But as I was listening to this guy talk, it led me to think about Nehemiah. When he had a great burden in his heart, our pa- the passage before actually says that he prayed day and night and fasted. We know that he was working as a, a cupbearer, so his day probably was right in the morning after he woke up. He had that moment, and the night before he slept. And in that moment of praying and listening and meditating, God opens up opportunities of creativity um, to re- really be able to pray upon the burdens of his heart and to think about the different next steps that he's going to take. And, and, and it's crazy. This week's sermon is called an opportunity, but what it should be called is an opportunity given by God that is realized through prayer. It would have been too long, so I was like, opportunity. But Nehemiah, before doing anything, spends this moment in prayer, before making a move, three to four months praying day and night, before attempting to do anything. And through that, an opportunity is realized, and he was able to actually seize it. You know, many of you I know are praying for new things in life, a lot of new transitions, new jobs. Uh, we have a lot of new children, so many births, a lot of new living situations. Um, and, and if it's not something new, some of you guys have a burden in your heart to do something, a burden for maybe a certain ministry, a burden for a life change, maybe for next steps, steps in your life. Um, the single people are praying over being married soon. Um, maybe you're praying for somebody else in your life, a loved one, someone in need, someone that doesn't know Christ, someone who just needs some prayer right now. 
There are going to be a few points that we can learn in our sermon today about what prayer can do for us as we move in. One, prayer helps us see opportunities. That's point one. Prayer helps us to seize the opportunities. And prayer also helps us to see the true actor behind the scenes. These are our three points. Prayer helps us see opportunities. Last week, we ended with this prayer, verse 11, that says, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of man, now as a cupbearer to the king. After spending months in prayer, you know, when I was reading this, I'm like, this is most likely a prayer that he was probably saying every day um, coming before him, Lord, grant me an opportunity to to speak to the king. Uh, We know that this is probably, um, he's speaking about the king because that's where he works every day. And he says, grant me mercy in the sight of man. I was a cupbearer to the king. See, Nehemiah has a realization. He realizes, realizes that this burden that he had in his heart, the sadness over his heart, see, God wasn't just calling him to pray over it. God wasn't just calling him to do it from a distance. But through his prayer, I think God was revealing, revealing to him that at times the, the things that we pray for, like God is calling you to actually be the answer to it. He was calling him to the task of doing something about it. I mean, In our prayers, God often moves us to be the answer. Notice Nehemiah recognizes himself as a cupbearer to the king. He realizes he's one of the few people that can do anything with the king or say anything to the king, I mean, that cares about Jerusalem at all. See, what we don't realize is by reading this text is that it's actually the king who who he's serving, King Artaxerxes, who stopped the work at the final end. If, if we read Ezra chapter 4, we see that people are just messing with the work that's going on. They don't want the walls to be built. They don't want the city to be rebuilt. And they stop it for decades and decades. And finally, they complain to the king. And the king stops it saying, okay, they might be rebellious. So he stops the work. And now Nehemiah is sitting there. He's praying for it. Like, Lord, what can, what, what can I do? How can I do this? You know, a lot of times we, we pray for different things in our life. We pray for miracles to happen. There's nothing, nothing wrong with this. We should be praying for those things. But oftentimes, more than just praying for a miracle, I think God is looking for those who are praying for an opportunity to do something about it. Those that are willing to say that they'll be a part of it. I mean, think about it for a moment. I mean, we pray for a lot of things in our life. We pray for our children. I know a lot of us, we, we're like, I hope our children are people of character and they grow up to do good things. But think about it. Instead of praying for for them to just be wise people with good character, our prayer should kind of change and say, as parents, we should pray that God will open up opportunities, opportunities for us to build character into their lives. I mean, say if you have friends or family that you would like to come to faith, don't just pray like, oh, Lord, be with their salvation. Pray for an opportunity to share the gospel. What's interesting about Nehemiah's prayer is that he never asked God to simply rebuild the city. Instead, he prays for mercy in the eyes of the king so that because he realizes what needs to be done. I, I think we're, we too are called to pray for opportuni- opportunities. But check this out. Not only does prayer cause us to look for opportunities, it also helps us to see them when they come. You know what I realize? You know, um, how many of you guys got prayer lists that you guys have to pray over and you guys actually consistently do this. So you're like, oh, why are you asking? You know we're not doing it. Um, but what I, what I realize is sometimes when you have a prayer, a prayer list and you pray over it, you begin to see opportunities for those prayers to actually be realized. I mean, think about it. If we're not praying for something, life gets going and, and we just kind of forget. I mean, even if it's something dire in our hearts that we need. But prayer gives us a different expectancy and therefore opens up our eyes of faith to see it. You know, there's so many times that I missed an opportunity to help someone simply because I wasn't keeping them in prayer. You know, pastors, we always say we're we're praying for you, but are they actually doing it? Like, we got to remind ourselves. For instance, someone can be looking for a job and they ask for prayer about it. A week later, you forget about it and someone comes up to you and says, yo, I'm looking for someone to hire. And then you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll pray for that too. And then you just kind of walk away and then you forget about all that and then you don't put the two together. You know, I've, I've, you know, two single people asking you to pray for them. You're like, you don't put the two together if you're not. See, what prayer does, it keeps the burden fresh in our hearts. Um, uh, I mean, prayer keeps the burden fresh and it makes our eyes op- open to actually see them when they come. See, Nehemiah has been keeping this prayer fresh in his heart for the past two to three, um, three to four months, day and night. I mean, he didn't come right away. He didn't just cry for a few days and pray for it and the opportunity just came. No, it came after a few months. 
I mean, he could have given up on it. He could have forgotten about the burden on his heart. He could have left it alone. But in his consistency of prayer, he move, it moves him to see it when it comes. But now it doesn't only just move him to see it. It also helps him to seize it. Let's look at it. Let's look at verses 1 through 2. 1 and 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing that you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. What we can kind of think about, that up to this point, Nehemiah is praying over this prayer. He probably didn't see any good opportunities come his way, so he kept it in prayer until this moment. Now you might think, yo, Nehemiah, why don't you have more faith? If you prayed upon it, why don't you just go up to the king and be like, yo, you got to make things happen. You got to change things and stuff like that. But see, back then, you were not able to speak to the king unless you were asked a question. So you're basically just kind of a quiet guy. You do things for him, but you don't say anything to him unless a question is asked to you. And not only that, I mean, if he went up to King Artaxerxes and was like, hey, you know, the, the, the thing that you did a while back where you stopped the work, that was a bad idea. You got to change your mind and switch things up. I mean, kings are very prideful. You do that, you might get yourself killed. But one day an opportunity came and Nehemiah was serving the king. I guess he had the burden on his heart. It was fresh in his heart. He was praying over it and maybe it showed in his face. And the king goes up to him. Uh, the king goes up to him and says, hey, what's wrong? But notice that Nehemiah makes it a point to say that he had not been sad in, the presence, in his presence before. This is actually really important to note because anyone who served the king, you couldn't have a sad face. I mean, it's kind of like if you work in the restaurant business, like if you're a waiter, you better not have a frown on your face or, or, or you know, like give, you grill people really hard while, while you serve them just because you're having a bad day. You got to smile. But I mean, if you're serving the king, this is kind of like law. You have to have a cheerful face so you don't ruin his day. So he had not been sad in his presence before, but this time he couldn't hold it. This is why he's terrified when the king says, why is your faith sad, seeing that you're not sick? There's nothing but sadness. This is nothing but sadness of the heart. But Nehemiah, he's able to see the opportunity here. See, the nuances of this wording makes it likely that the king is kind of joking around with him right now. He didn't take offense to it. It was probably in a good mood. I mean, it could have been a party or something. His wife was next to him. Usually when, when the wife or, or somebody is next to him, that means it's more of a party scene rather than an official scene. And he's looking at him. He says, you know, he says it in a real good way. You can tell he kind of likes him. It's basically saying, one commenter said, it's basically saying like, hey, kid, why do you have a frown? You know, you're not really sick. Did a girl break your heart? What's going on? But this moment is still scared, scary for Nehemiah. I mean, he could have joked it off, be like, yeah, yeah, some girl broke my heart or something. He could have said something and passed it off. But he speaks from the heart. He doesn't rush and demand something. He speaks in his brokenness, in his, in his, from his humble prayers and says this, I said to the king, let the king live forever. This is a typical saying that you say before requesting anything to the king. And he says this, why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? There's a genuine sincerity that he has at this moment that came out came pouring out of him naturally, a freshness of this burden of his heart. I mean, wise people can often read people like a book. I mean, can't you tell when a child asks you something out of like sincerity versus like, I just want something? I think this is a moment too. When genuine sincerity is seen, it's often, it often moves the heart and the king's heart is moved. I mean, Nehemiah makes it personal too. He doesn't say Jerusalem. He doesn't use words that might spike something in the, in, in the king's mind, but he says, my hometown where my fathers are buried. And it leads the, the king to ask another question. He says, and what are you requesting? And at this moment, Nehemiah drops, he doesn't drop to his knees, but I think in his head he's praying because it, it says, like, I prayed now. Like, it was like, oh my gosh, this is the moment of truth. I prayed. And he said this, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it, set, oh, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's grave, that I may rebuild it. Gosh, you know, this request is so beautiful because it shows us something. It shows that he's been thinking about this for a while. He's been picturing this moment in his head for a while. He, he visioned it. This is not just a random, a random request or an impromptu request. I mean, he just doesn't scream saying, yo, I got to get out of here. Let me go back. He says, no, king, 
you have to send me back. You have to send me back. I need your resources. I need what you have. You have to send me back. King, recognizing his humility, he asks how long he would be gone, and when he responds, he finds favor in this. But Nehemiah is not done. He asks for more. You can tell because he's been praying over this for a while. He, he's probably been praying over the steps of this for a while. He said this. In verse 7, it says this, And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let the letters be given to me, to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to do all these things. You know, Proverbs sixteen nine says this, The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. You know, a part of having faith and a part of praying over something over and over again is not just praying for things to, to happen. It's not just praying for you to be a part of it, but it's even praying over specific steps that need to be done. It's preparing for it in your heart and praying over that preparation and thinking it through. Guys, this will change the way you pray, man. I mean, think about it. In Nehemiah's head, he was praying over the steps or he wouldn't have been able to seize this opportunity. Nehemiah thought in his head, he was like, you know what? I need the king First, if this is going to happen, I need the king to send me. I can't just leave and do it on my own. Second, the road is rough. I need, I need permission to go through the roads. And I need to even have an army around me to protect me. There's opposition. We later see that there's an army around them. Two, and, and three, he was like, yo, I need the resources. I don't have money. I can go back. We can do nothing. I need the king's wood. I need the king's forest. We need resources. Guys, sometimes in our prayers... God does answer them and gives us opportunities, but sometimes we can't seize those opportunities because we haven't been praying over the steps. You know, a part of being under construction is not just dreaming of the end goals, but it's thinking of the steps that need to be done for this process to happen. Assuming you have it all. I mean, alone we might not have all the resources, and it may be impossible for us alone, but if God opens up those opportunities, all that can happen in an instant. Guys, I see this happening in the mission field all the time and in God's kingdom work all the time. You know, after I became, um, you know, joined the effort to, to plant this church, you just meet a lot of other church planners. And, you know, you hear a lot of different presentations. And, and I, I didn't know that pastors get, like, pokes from missionaries all the time saying, can, I, can, I, can, can, can you guys support me and all that. I, I, hear, I hear mission statements and, and, and vision things all the time. Um, and let me be honest with you guys. Like, preaching the sermon, like, was uncomfortable to me because I see myself lack in so many of these areas. But meeting these missionaries and church planners, they have all these visions to do things. They have diagrams of steps on, on they're going to take. They have dreams of what could be. They're like, we're going to build a mission center, an orphanage. We're going to build a seminary in another country. And we're going to plant another church soon. But sometimes when I meet these guys and I'm like looking at it, and mathematically speaking, I'm like, yo, you guys are dead broke. Oh, my gosh. Like, sometimes I know the people. I'm like, oh, I know you got a lot of debt from seminary and and all that and you're not making anything like and these projects require so many resources so much money and manpower that they don't have them but that they don't have at the moment but they pray and they keep that 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 burden fresh and you know what i realize that a lot of these guys with these types of visions these guys that are praying and planning even though they have no resources at the moment they often get more done for the kingdom than those that simply count the cost and say that it's impossible you know, I study at Westminster a lot right now, and there's so many international students there. I get to meet, meet some of them, um, and uh, some, sometimes they have um, such awesome testimonies. You know, they're like, you know, mathematically speaking, like, we shouldn't be here. It costs us a fortune um, to, go, to, to come to America to do anything. But we simply had a prayer and a vision and a plan and came here. And God has been opening doors again and again. And I get so encouraged, and I, I get challenged when I meet these type of pre people. And it moves even me to pray and imagine for our church. It moves me to plan and pray for our far future, even though we're like, yo, man, we can't, I don't think we can do those things. Because I know that those who pray and plan and prepare and vision, God opens up opportunities and helps us to see them. Prayer helps us to seize the opportunities in life. But the last point I think is even more important. It also helps us acknowledge the God behind the scenes. Prayer helps us see the true actor behind the scenes. You know, check this out. Before our passage ends, Nehemiah writes the most important component of our sermon today. This last sentence of our passage, verse 8, the second part of it, it says this, And the king granted me what I've asked, what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. You know, this is the most reassuring verse that, that, that I've ever read. 
Nehemiah, Nehemiah recognizes that all things are in the hands of God. He recognizes that it's not his own strength or even his own, own prayers or even his own boldness that made this happen. It's not just the ability to make perfect plans but it, it's, or, or opportunities to happen. In fact, he recognizes that everything, everything was given by God. Not only the opportunity, but even the burden in his heart because only God changes the heart, right? You know, this whole under construction business was not Nehemiah's business. It was God's business. For God's good hand, the good hand of my God was upon me. You know, God knew exactly what he was doing. Nehemiah was in the right place at the right time. God had planned for this to happen in history. He had brought Nehemiah to the palace for a reason. They were exiled and his family was brought there for a reason. And this is the confession that springs from an understanding of the gospel. For the good hand of God, my God was upon me. His favor, his grace was upon me. You know, for those of you guys who know me, I'm really a pra pragmatist. You know, I'm not really much of a dreamer or a visionary for that matter. This whole church planning business was the most anxious thing I've ever done in my life. But more and more, I think the only thing that I was able to hold on to was this. God's good hand would be upon me. And I held on to the promise that Jesus Christ makes to Peter in Matthew 16, 18, right? I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Christ will build his church. Christ has set the foundation for it with his blood on the cross. And the only reason that there is a church and for all of us here is because of this. And little by little, I gain confidence. I think it's the same promise for you. God will build you. God will build my church. You're a part of the church. We're all a part of this. And we all have things that God, places that God has placed us in and different situations and burdens that God has placed into our own hearts. You know, I want to encourage you guys. Look to the man who is working behind the scenes and he will not only walk with you, but he has already walked through it for you. Guys, in the person of Jesus, we see this redeeming and rebuilding process at its climax. We see Jesus who had a burden for his people. We see Jesus who prayed day and night for the mission. We see Jesus who did just didn't pray, but he planned, he had a plan for redemption from the beginning of time. Seeing our sins and loving us came down from heaven, living the perfect life that we should have lived dying the death for us, predicting it, walking towards the cross his entire life, telling his followers in three days he's going to ri resurrect from the dead, leaving us with a mission to do the same before ascending to heaven, promising the power of the Holy Spirit upon our lives so that we can carry out the reconstruction work not only in our own hearts but in the world. God's good hand has been upon us too. You know, all of us have things on our hearts, have different burdens. God has placed it there, maybe a vision for the new year, Maybe we have different passions. If we all have responsibilities, that means there's a vision within it, right? If you have a family, there's a vision for somewhere, for, for, some, for something or somewhere for them to be. For your kids, your relationship. If you're working, that means you have a vision for it. If not for the actual work, then at least for the resources that you have that you get from it. For the single people in here looking to get married, I mean, you guys are praying for a lot of things, visioning for the future, so many options, um, so much time, so many doors that could be taken, moving out of town, traveling, I don't know, dating and seeing who you can build a life with. In all this, I want, I want to ask you guys, will you spend moments in prayer, prayer, to ask God to move your heart for what moves his, and may we pray and plan for eternal things. You know, Elder Juan always says this to me. Um, he said this a few times um, in, in our leaders' meetings and stuff like this. But he says there's three resources we often look to before we make a move for God or before we do anything. And those three resources is time, money, and energy. Time, money, and energy. But we always have excuses, right? When you're young, you have a lot of time and you have a lot of energy, but you have no money. I mean, college, college student, or you just don't have money. You can't do anything. So you don't really pray for things. You don't vision anything for God. When you're middle-aged, um, a lot of us in this room or in this boat um, with kids, you have, you have the money, uh, you have the energy, well, at least some, more, some days more than not, but you have no time. You kids take all your time. Like, you just suck, suck it all up, and you're working. You've you got no time. So we never spend a moment in prayer to vision for something for, for God's kingdom. And then when you're old, you, you have a lot of time. You, you have a lot of time. You have a lot of money, but you have no energy. And you, you get tired. You say, like, I can't do what I used to do. And this tells us there's always an excuse not to pray in vision for what could be for God's kingdom. You know, the right answer is always be praying. Always be praying. Always be imagining what could be for God. And saying to God, not only do I pray for this, give me an opportunity. 
Help me to see it when it comes and give me the power to be bold and the wisdom to know what to do with it and having the confidence knowing that your life is in God's hands. May this be our prayer. Let's pray.